country, you know, somewhere over there, won't make any difference. But uh, wherever it is, um, he started the church from scratch um, in the mid 90s. Um, the currently attendance is about 14,000, so um, it's certainly uh, a church that's grown. Great ministry, um, and I, I probably let my bias slip out a little bit when I say the best ministry of all was, was one of our own Australian preachers, and that was um, our national president, Wayne Alcorn. Some really great ministry. In fact, that one was so good, I'm going to do something I don't often do, and one Sunday night we're just going to screen um, one of the sessions from Wayne Alcorn. So after finishing that conference, I then had to go off to another one, which was the uh, a chaplain's conference uh, with the uh, State Emergency Service. And uh, that was interesting. It was very interesting because, uh, among many other things, uh, I had a chance to sit down uh, with a guy and he get to see once every year or two, depending whether we both end up going to the conference. Um, and he's uh, one of the other SES chaplains, but um, he's a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi. And it's, it's good sometimes just to sit down with, um, with him and, and find lots of little things, like when you read the Bible and you say Eli, we always pronounce that Eli, okay? Well, that's his name, so I guess he knows how to pronounce it, Eli. So I had a chance to sit down with Eli for, for a little bit of time and... Um, Found a few things uh, of interest, as I normally do when I talk to him, um, and I'll just touch on one of them uh, this morning. Um, there, there's uh, people uh, right around the world at the moment uh, who are teaching that the name Jesus is not a name that we should use. They say we've got to use the name Yeshua. Now, I, I already have said to some of them, well, that's actually not accurate because it's a made-up word. It certainly wasn't Jesus' name, the name Yeshua. It's based on the, a misunderstanding, actually, of the, um, of, of the Hebrew language. It's very similar, but not quite the same uh, as the name uh, that Jesus actually bore. In, in English, we um, use the name Jesus, which we get from the Greek. Uh, the Nordic languages gave us Jason and a sort of a diluted version um, of the Hebrew gave us Joshua. They're all the one name. So what I said to my friend Ellie, just so I wasn't going to put any thoughts in his mind, I said, Ellie, what was the name of the son of Nun? Okay, now, I knew he'd know what I was talking about, and I wasn't going to put any word in his mouth. Um, and uh, he said, Hosua ben non. Okay. Hosua. So you can see where we get Joshua from pretty easily. Uh, the son of Nun. Uh, he, what he said, and this, this is the thing that I found very interesting. Hosua was one of the spies. And this is, this is how he started to answer the question. He said, one of the spies that was sent out was, was, was Hosua ben Non. And he was, we know him as Joshua, of course, everybody understands that. Uh, and that name, the name Hosua, means salvation. But before he departed, Moses blessed him and uh, said that God would be with him. And in doing that, he actually changed his name. We all know that um, the Hebrew people had this name that was not able to be pronounced. Okay, the tetragram is what we know it as, but it's, it's a name that couldn't be pronounced and we try and make Jehovah out of that so we can say it. Well, he said what Moses did was to bless him by putting a little Y in front of his name. And that meant it would change the meaning, God is our salvation. So his name became the Y, yeah, Hosua. Okay? You can easily see where we get Joshua, can't you? It's 
pretty, pretty easy to see. Uh, when the Bible was translated, interestingly, when the Bible was translated from Hebrew into Greek 200 years BC, the, the Jewish scholars, the Hebrew scholars, um, translated um, the Bible into what we know as the Septuagint. And the book that we call Joshua was called Jesus. Jesus. That was the, and obviously that's where we get the English name Jesus. And in fact, in his own time, Jesus would have been known by the Hebrew-speaking people as Ehosua and by the Greek and Latin-speaking people as Jesus. Isn't it interesting that above him on the cross it was written in three languages, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. So the Hebrew would have had one name and the, um, the, the Greek and Latin would have had the other. So there's a little by the way. Okay? Just a, sorry? That's a freebie. It is indeed. Um, courtesy of my, uh, my friend Ellie. I've got to ask him why he says Ellie and not Eli, but I wasn't going to push it. I've... Um, I've had times in the past where um, years ago I was doing some study and, and um, I had a, a, f a friend who was helping me, who was a, who was a rabbi uh, from the great synagogue in Bondi. And uh, although he, his name was Gary, um, which doesn't sound very Jewish, he, um, Gary Appel, but um, I could not afford not to have him helping me and um, it was rather frustrating at times because he'd be telling me stuff and there were times I wanted to pick him up by the collar and shake him and say, can't you see Jesus? <laughs> but I just couldn't do that. Tempting and all as it was. All right. Let's just pray and we'll look in the word. Father, just let your word work in us this morning to accomplish your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time we were looking at John 15 and some foundational stuff on Jesus saying, I am the true vine, you are the branches, and my Father is the vine dresser. And we noticed that the context in which Jesus spoke uh, these words was when he was speaking to his disciples just before Judas betrayed him. And last time we focused particularly on the fact that Jesus is the true vine and, and it's so important for us to be grafted in, joined into to that line of blessing that flows through the true vine so that we receive the blessings that naturally flow from Jesus. And so we know that Jesus is the true vine and so I want to come now uh, to the next character in that analogy where he said the vine dresser or the husbandman is the father. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Of course this is the person that takes care of the vine. Now I don't know anything about vines nor from vine dressers as far as that's concerned. Vines have got something to do with gardening. And on anything to do with gardening, I can plead absolute ignorance. And if you don't believe me, ask George. Okay. I know that grass is green. Unless it's in little plastic bags and then it's probably brown. Um, and I, I know that trees, I know that trees have branches and so do vines. But really, when it comes to it, I, I only know what I have, um, have, have heard and read. I, I know, like I said, that, that grass is, is nice and green, unless, well, you go, it can be made into other things, like that's brown, I guess. Now, there's a story, there's a story of, a, uh, of an African king, and he was uh, a wild man, and he'd go and he'd knock over another tribe and take the king captive, take his throne, and he built a little upstairs room in his, in his house. And he did this several times. 
until he had a half a dozen of them up there and a wind came and the whole thing collapsed. And of course we know the moral of the story, people who live in grass houses shouldn't <laughs> stow thrones. So, all right, there's, there's some knowledge of grass. All right, and that's about where my, that's about where my knowledge of gardening finishes. But from what I can understand in reading around, I can understand that the vine dresser has two primary responsibilities. And Jesus referred to them. He cuts off the branches that are dead and he prunes the branches that are bearing fruit. Now, that's pretty much it apart from water and sunlight and all the things that happen there. But basically it's a pruning process that directs the the, the power of the sun and the light and so forth and the water uh, to make the branches productive. And what you don't want is a fruitless branch. You don't want a dead branch kind of sucking energy when it can't produce anything. You don't want little sucker things shooting off, off the side that, that is sapping out the, the strength, the life, of the branch that could be producing fruit. So the vine dresser has a responsibility to, to get rid of the branches that are fruitless. He prunes and he cares for the ones that are fruit bearing. And this is exactly what the Bible says that the Father does. Every branch that bears no fruit, he takes away. The vine dresser cuts off the branches that are fruitless. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes. Sorry, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? And the Bible says, so it can bear more fruit. So it can bear more fruit. It can become more productive than it previously was. So the father's responsibility is the, the pruning and removing. First of all, he takes away the fruitless branch. We'll cover this a little bit later on, but I, I touched on it last time. There is no such thing as a fruitless Christian. Okay, we'll explain why, but there is no such thing as a fruitless Christian. Now, as we said last time, people, when they read this passage in in John 15 say, well, well, Jesus is talking about fruitless Christians. And I say, no, he's not, and we'll see why as we go. Every branch produces fruit. Every true branch will produce fruit, some fruit. It might be little. It might be an abundance, but there will be fruit. Now, before we go too much further, don't start judging people, whatever you do, because you must understand that part of the fruit is repentance. And you don't see that, only God does. Only God can see that fruit. Only his eyes are, are tuned finely enough to see it. So we're going to uh, get there in a, in a few moments. Okay, but a branch that doesn't bear fruit, a branch that doesn't bear fruit is, it's a dead giveaway or a dead branch or whatever, but uh, it has no life. It's what we call last time a Judas branch. And so what the father does, he cuts off that fruitless branch. He gets rid of it because it's not genuine. It's not a true branch. It's not a fruit-bearing branch. It has been associated with the vine. There's an identification there that's with it, but there is no reality. There is no life of the vine flowing in it. It's a masquerade. It's made for all sorts of reasons. In context of the church, which is what Jesus was talking about, it might be that the, the fruitless branch, the false branch is, is there and associating with the, brand, with the true vine because it might appease somebody, might appease a family member, 
or it might be that the person just likes to hang around uh, with Christians, but whatever it is, it hasn't truly been joined to the vine. So the person has never had a real personal encounter with Christ. So the father, the vine dresser, ultimately removes the so-called dead branch, the people who are Christian by name only, what we call nominal Christians, I guess. In essence, what he's doing is separating the tares and the wheat. Matthew uses the analogy of the tares and the wheat. And he separates the tares and the wheat. He separates the sheep and the goats. And if you look at a Middle Eastern flock, you will find it very hard to distinguish between the sheep and the goats at just a cursory glance. You actually have to look quite carefully to see the difference. And likewise with the, um, the wheat and the tares. So the father wants to separate them out and he has a responsibility towards the fruit-bearing ones. Now that's where we want to focus, but that's us. That's the, those who are truly born again. So what does he do to the fruit-bearing branches? Well, he prunes them so they can produce more fruit. You know, every one of us, every Christian that ever has been, gets little sucker shoots coming off from time to time. You know, little distractions, little sins, whatever, that sap away the energy, sap away the life. And instead of our energies and, and our efforts being, being put into to God's power of fruit producing in our life, we get diverted. We get sidetracked. And our strength is, is sapped and our energy is misdirected because we're focusing on those little sucker shoots rather than on the task that we're supposed to be performing, and that is bearing fruit. And so the Father is pruning us in order for us to bear fruit, and the Bible says fruit and much fruit. Fruit and much fruit. Now, as I said, there's no such a thing as a no fruit Christian. There are a whole lot of Christians who are little fruit Christians. And that's fine. A whole lot where the Lord might look and say, Ooh, I see a fruit periodically. Just a little. And Christians are actually defined in these terms. We'll come to that one in a minute. Christians are defined in these terms. Little fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. But they are never defined as no fruit. Okay? And that's why this slide's there. I never can quite understand when somebody says, gee, they're half dead. We've got one med student. Are there any other med students here? Tell me, James, can a person be half dead? <laughs> Brain dead. Definition, there's still life in them. You know, we've either got life or we haven't. There's no such thing as being somewhere between. What is it that's somewhere between life and no life? Nothing. Nothing. I could not have imagined what would have happened if my wife had come to me one time and said, I've just done a test and I'm half pregnant. Well... Um, you are or you're not? Come on, what is it? You know, we, we don't have these half measures when it comes to life. It's simply not possible. Either dead or alive. Life or no life. There are no half measures and that's the way it is with Christians. Sometimes God has to look real hard to find the fruit, but it's there. Sometimes he gets his heavenly stethoscope and he puts it on them, and he listens, a minute, two minutes, three minutes, and then he hears a little, oh yeah, there was one, 
There they are beaten. It's there. They have life. But he wants a more regular heartbeat. He might search and find a little fruit. Well, he says, there's life there, but I want more fruit. I want more fruit. And so he prunes them and sets them up to produce more fruit. Can, can we grab the picture? Okay, looking at these branches. Every branch, these two kinds of branches that he talks about. Some branches are set aside. Some branches are pruned. Now just think about these two for a minute. The ones who have no fruit, the branches that have no fruit, they profess, they associate with, they, on Sunday night we're doing a series on, on fans and followers. They, they are fans of Jesus, but they're not real followers. They, they associate, but they're not genuine. They're like the tares that are growing uh, with the wheat because there cannot be a no-fruit Christian. Passengers on a, on a commercial airliner have to entrust themselves to the plane when they want to fly somewhere. And they place themselves in the plane and once they're there, for better or worse, their destiny is linked with the destiny of the plane. If the plane rises to 30,000 feet, they go to 30,000 feet. If the plane crashes, the passengers crash along with it. And when the plane arrives at its destination, the passengers arrive at the destination in exactly the same moment. Is it possible for a plane to arrive in Sydney but the passengers arrive in Melbourne? No. Is it possible for some of the passengers to arrive in Melbourne and the rest to arrive in, in Sydney? No, no. It happens to our bags, but it doesn't happen to the people. <laughs> but you see, the problem with the bags is that they weren't on the plane. They were on the wrong one. They were in another plane altogether, and so they arrived at a different destination. It's not possible for the plane to arrive and the passengers to come in even a second or an hour or whatever later. Everyone on that aircraft arrive at the same moment at the same place as that aircraft. And in the same way, in exactly the same way, we need to understand that the Bible teaches us, as Paul, the way that Paul describes this, is we are in Christ. We are in Christ. And we in Christ, and if I can use the exactly the same words as I did in relation to the aircraft, for better or for worse, and I can guarantee it's for better, our destiny is tied to the destiny of Jesus because we are in him. So what happens to him ultimately happens to us because we are in him. We are forever linked by the Father to the death, burial and resurrection and ascension of Christ. We are forever uh, linked to Jesus because we are in him. We are seated now in heavenly places in Christ. Please never, ever forget that. God considers us to have been crucified, buried, resurrected and seated just as it does him. And it cannot be otherwise. It can't, just impossible for it to be anything different to that. If we are in Christ, just as if we are in an aeroplane, the destiny is tied to that which we are in. Our destiny is linked to him. Now, understand, church, that means that when Jesus is now seated in the throne room of heaven, that is the place that we occupy in the spiritual realm. We are now seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I love it when, when I'm reminded of the reality of my position in Christ. 
If anyone this morning, if anyone feels as though you're unloved, let me ask you a question. Does the Father love Jesus, the Son? The answer is pretty simple. Well, I want to tell you, as he is, so are we in this world. Why is that? It is because we are in him. And whatever concerns him concerns us. Our destiny is linked to his. Our place is linked to his. What he is, so are we in this world. It took me a long time to learn that. I was brought up very much in the association with Jesus and grafting into Jesus and being one of his. I understood all of that. But all of the blessings were always going to be somewhere in the future. And as I said, then great to have the blessings in the sweet by and by, but we need them in the nasty now and now because this is when we really, really need to know who we are. This is when we really need to know our authority in Christ. Do you know what? When we get to heaven, we won't need our authority. <laughs> Isn't that good? We won't need to evangelize. We won't need to be fruit bearers. Interesting. But now we do. And it's good to know that, that when we are in any circumstance in life, that we are already in Christ and have the benefits and the blessing and the authority that he has. Now, we might find it hard to use, but it is so important for us to see ourselves as God sees us. Do not see yourself as someone unloved, unimportant, or un-anything. You are in Christ. You have been made complete. The life of Christ flows within you. You are loved, you are accepted, you are forgiven. You've been made whole. Sometimes we, we look and we think, gee, I can think of some of the sins that I've committed and I feel really bad about them. Well, repentance is appropriate, but we don't need them to hang around. We don't need that, that sense to hang around because no matter what it is, you have been forgiven if you're in Christ. There's no exceptions. There's no little bits. There's no part life. You either have his life or you don't. You're either in Christ or you're not. And if you are, you have all the benefits, all the blessing of being in him. You're forgiven. You're whole. It's so important for us to see ourselves like that. Blessed is the man, Jeremiah wrote, who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to produce fruit. Never fails to produce fruit. Jesus in Matthew 13 told another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seeds in the field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Now remember what Jesus said about the harvest. When is the harvest? The harvest is the end of the age. 
So the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds were going to grow together. Why was it that the farmer said to the servant, don't go and pull them up? Well, he said, you might pull up the wrong ones. It's to protect the wheat. That's right. You might pull up the wrong ones. You see, sometimes the phony ones look real. Sometimes they look even more real than the real ones. And so we might be growing together with the tares. But at the harvest, it'll get sorted. Okay? So if this morning, let me say this, if you are wheat, don't worry if there's some tares around. If you are one of the tears, do something about it. Get yourself joined to Jesus and become the real thing. And so we go on. Let both grow together at the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvest, harvesters, first collect the weeds. Tie them in bundles to be burnt. Can you see the, the analogy here in Matthew is very similar to the one about the vine. Okay, the husbandman weeds, he, he cuts off, he, he gets rid of the dead branches and what does he do? He throws them into the fire. And then here we, we find, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. The wheat, and I want you to note this please. Here in this analogy in Matthew, so you can see the same picture in relation to the vine. The wheat is never thrown out to be burned. The wheat doesn't get thrown away. There's life there. There mightn't be a lot of grain in the head, but there is fruit. And sometimes you need to be the farmer to know where the fruit is. The tares are thrown out, but the wheat is never. And the catch is no one really knows the difference until they are finally separated. I guess the big difference is this. The tares will not produce grains of wheat. Will not produce grains of wheat. Now let me just say something about the fruit. And I'm just going to use the wheat here before we come back to the vine. The Bible says, it's an Old Testament picture that, that we get, but the Bible says that the rain and the snow fall down from heaven and it doesn't go back without watering the earth. And it waters the earth for a purpose. And it says, so that it can produce... Anybody remember what it produces? It is it's seed, but it is for two purposes. Sowing and eating. That's right. So it can, uh, the rain and the snow does not return until it produces fruit, until it produces seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So the fruit that we produce has two purposes in our life. One purpose is to build us up. It is to become our bread. It, it becomes the food that builds us and strengthens us and equips us to go out and do what we do from day to day. That's one purpose of the seed. But it is the same seed that is taken out and sown. Why is that? Because you see, let me tell you, when that seed, within that seed is life. And what we are doing is taking life and either consuming the life, putting the life into us, or getting the life and putting it into somebody else. Can you see? Okay. You mightn't think there's a lot of life in bread. Probably in the stuff that we eat these days, there's not. Um, Chris and I don't eat much bread now. We used to. We don't eat much bread at all now. But when we did, we tend, what we tended to do was to buy wheat and to grind it and make our own nice and fresh. Now, there was a reason for that. It wasn't particularly that we liked grinding. 
I tell you what. You put some wheat in and you hand grind it. I tell you what, by the time you've got enough to produce flour that will produce a loaf of bread, you could eat the whole loaf. You've just about used all the energy. Okay. So the idea is you get a motor and put on it. All right. Does it quicker and with a lot less energy. But one of the things that I found out that was interesting was that when you grind wheat, if you leave it for 24 hours, it's basically lost all its value. Now, they reckon you could leave it in a sealed container in the fridge for a couple of days, but no more than that. So when you buy flour in the shops, guess what? <laughs> okay, the, the cardboard packet has probably got as much value. But when you go back into Jesus' time, when they talked about bread, in fact, even more recently, you know, people were put on diets of bread and water. And remember Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. You'd think, and I'd hope he couldn't, well, he wouldn't live by, he wouldn't survive on our bread alone, but he would have on theirs. The interesting thing about wheat is that the, the chemical makeup of wheat, so I'm told, is in the perfect, it, it has the perfect balance for the human body. It is the perfect food for the human body. The, the wheat is the perfect food for us. So if we get wheat and turn it to flour and then make our bread, we actually are making life-sustaining food. Isn't that interesting? And interesting the way we destroy life-sustaining food as well. But nonetheless, when Jesus said man shall not live by bread alone, he was spot on. He was spot on. Man could do that, but he's saying you don't just want natural, you want the spiritual. So we produce, the rain produces seed for the sower and bread for the eater. It is producing life for us or life for us to give to others. Okay, Ephesians 2, Bible says, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Notice what it then says. To do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Matthew, when did God know you were going to become a Christian? Before the foundation of the earth. Yep. And first day you were... Another way you say it, so you're talking about the foundation of the earth. Before the foundation of the earth, that's right. You, were not, you did not surprise God. One thing God never says is, ooh. <laughs> the other thing he never says is, oops. Okay. <laughs> They're the two things that God never says. You never catch God by surprise. You can't surprise God. And so he knew well, well in advance, before the foundation of the earth was even laid, he knew that you were going to receive life, that you were going to be grafted into the vine. And so he designated right back then works which God prepared for us to do. He already designed the fruit for you. So let me encourage you today with this. Sometimes when we look and we see people doing great things for the kingdom, we think, oh, I wish I could be like that. Let me tell you, if, if God has designated the fruit for you to bear to be, let's use an example. Somebody once told me that they were just the cleaner and I went crook on them because there's no such a thing as just anything in the kingdom. And if, if the fruit that God has prepared for you is to prepare the house of the Lord for his people, then I want to tell you, you do that and you get the same reward as the big bloke. All right, Because if you are fulfilling your purpose, if you are producing the fruit which God prepared in advance for you to do, 
He designed you like that. He's going to honor you for doing what he has given you to do. Can you grab that? You never need to look at somebody else and compare yourself to anyone else. All you need to compare yourself to is what God has told you to do. And if you fulfill your calling in him, then you are creating the fruit which God prepared in advance for you to do. Now, can you see here that even in this verse, if you really think about it, there's no such thing as a fruitless Christian. Okay, We're all designed to bear fruit. The life of God is in you. There will be fruit. Remember that part of the fruit of the kingdom is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And, and you cannot judge another to know if the righteousness of God is flowing in them. Only they and God know that. So don't try and work out somebody else's fruit. Focus on your own. Okay? Focus on your own. The Holy Ghost lives in us and he produces the fruit that is called righteousness. And the first effect of righteousness is that it bears eternal life. It produces eternal life. And so it is impossible for anybody to get to heaven without eternal life, without righteousness. Therefore, you can't be without fruit <laughs> it doesn't you know, it's pretty simple the true vine gives life to every branch grafted in every branch that is connected to him produces fruit a good tree produces good fruit that is righteousness peace joy in the Holy Ghost and all the other good things that God wants us specifically to do but a tree, a, a, a branch that is not a tree, that is not a good tree, cannot produce that. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And that's, that's what he's saying. It's pretty, pretty simple. The believer, the true believer will have good fruit that starts with eternal life. Every tree that brings forth good fruit Fruit is, is a tree that is genuine. And a corrupt tree, we know what happens there. There has to be good fruit that comes from the life of the believer. In Matthew, John the Baptist called the Pharisees, you snakes. Bring forth then fruit that is fit for repentance. Through repentance produce fruit. Don't say now, I want you to hear this. Don't say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you now, God can turn these stones into children of Abraham. Now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Can you see the same picture? Cut down, cast into the fire. And what he's saying here, what John is saying here to, to these Jewish leaders was very simple. Your nationality is no longer enough. The true vine has arrived. You must connect to the true vine. You have to repent. There needs to be the fruit of repentance linked into the true vine and that's the way life comes. The analogy is the same all the way through. The dead wood, not true believers. All Christians will have fruit. In John 6, now I said one time recently, it's interesting that um, this is John 6, 66. So it's 666, okay? And it's interesting that in 666, it says that from this point on, many of the disciples or followers turned away from him. Many of them turned away. They were identifying with Christ. But they weren't for real. They weren't genuine. They said they believe. And Jesus said, okay, if you believe in my name, you'll continue with me. But they said, no, we can't. Not after that. No, 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 no. And they left. All right. Really quickly, the fruit-bearing ones, that's us. You might have a little fruit. You might have a lot of fruit. And that's, that's fine. 
But here, I don't know whether this is good news or bad news. But you're going to get pruned. You're going to get pruned. Now, it's interesting that the word that's used here in pruning is kathirai, and, and this word means to cleanse, to cleanse. So what actually he does is he cleanses us by pruning. It's a term that's used in, in agriculture um, about the pruning off of the shoots and, and all of those little useless things that might, may grow that are going to stop the fruit. And the actual pruning, the actual operation, however, is done by the Word of God. When you read this, the Bible tells us that, that it is His Word that is going to do the cleaning and the pruning. Circumstances in themselves will not improve us. They just tear us open. A bit like the surgeon. When he slices us open, if that's all he did, it would be a bit of a problem. But it is when we're sliced open, and that's what the circumstances might do to our life on occasions. It might feel a bit raw. But you see... When we're open, then the word can come in and fix the problem. Okay? The scalpel doesn't solve the problem. It just opens up so the doctor can get in and do what he needs to do. Circumstances might work like that. But ultimately, if we allow in those circumstances the word of God to work in us, then... I look at the, the bushfire situation and I think of how incredibly sad it is and, and how horrible it is for people to lose everything like that. I can't imagine the feeling. But yet in those circumstances, that has cut people open. For those who know the Lord, he can bring beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, so they can grow and be trees of righteousness, and they can, they can produce much fruit where, where they are. Trial and suffering might put the pressure on us, but the word of God comes in in such circumstances and creates growth. God's word, living and active. Now, please... Please don't ever, and somebody was talking to me recently about this, but don't ever say, God did it. God made these negative circumstances. God made me sick. God made the fires burn my house down. God did this, that, or something else that is negative. God is good. He is intrinsically good. His character, nature is good, and he can only produce good fruit. But we live in a world that is fallen. And that does not mean when somebody is sick or has something happened to them that they have sinned. And I get very annoyed when I hear preachers come out and we'll probably hear some. I'm just waiting for it. The Greenies have already come out and said it's Tony Abbott's fault, these bushfires. They, literally, they have. They've, they've been on the media and said it's Tony Abbott's fault because he was cutting out the... the, the um, carbon tax. He hadn't done it yet, but just thinking about it apparently causes fires. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm quite sure that I'm going to hear some preacher come along and say it is God's judgment because of something that they can find that somebody did wrong. I want to tell you God is a good God. He doesn't work that way. He doesn't create the negative thing. But what he will do, what he will do is when that that wound is opened. He will use whatever circumstance that we find ourselves in. We live in a world that is fallen. And because we live in a world that is fallen, you and I suffer from the results of a fallen world. My mum died of cancer. Was it because she was a sinner? No, it was because Adam was. That's why. It brought sin and destruction into the world. 
But I want to tell you that, that when those circumstances come and, and those wounds are opened by whatever it might be that happens around us, God's word can work in us and produce really good fruit, really good things. Okay? So let's be encouraged to know that in all things, God works together for good to those who love him. Is that you? And you're called according to his purpose. Remember about that fruit that was there before the foundation of the earth? So you're obviously called according to his purpose. You fit, you qualify, good things come. God will turn things, no matter what they are, he will turn them to produce good fruit. So this morning, if you are in Christ, then you are joined to him as a new creation. You are joined to the vine and as a result to the other branches. We, we join together as, as a whole vine, not just a one branch vine, but the whole vine. We join together as a community. Don't, don't, con don't, Restrict yourself to have to conform with, with rituals or laws or whatever. You are in Christ. Focus on that. Know that you are in him. You are joined to him. You're joined to the true vine. You're a branch with the life flowing through you. Bound for heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely. But we make the journey together and that journey can be a great, great journey. I'm going to finish with just one simple little story. You might have heard it before, but let me just tell you very, very simply. Abraham wanted a bride for his son. Abraham, the great father, greatest father ever, according to the great religions of the world. Abraham had a son, a son who he offered as a sacrifice and received him back, the Bible says, as though it was from the dead. Can you see a bit of a picture developing here? Well, when he wanted a bride for his son, he sent a servant out. The servant was Eliezer. He said, go into this far country and find a bride. So Eliezer did that, went into the far country, found a bride and told the bride about the son of the father and this bride immediately fell in love with him. She'd never met him, never seen him. Only just on what the servant had said did. Do you still get a picture? The thing that's interesting is that what the servant Eliezer then did with poor Rebecca was to pick her up and shove her on a camel. Now, I tell you, if you want to do something that is unpleasant, go for a camel ride. <laughs> now, I've been on a camel ride just along a beach. That was far enough. All right. I could not imagine riding a camel for several days. It would take me months to recover, I'm sure. They hump, they're uncomfortable, they turn around and spit at you. <laughs> Just when you think you're about balanced, you almost fall off. They're a horrible creature to ride. And so what did Eliezer do? He put the bride for the son of the father on a camel, for goodness sake. You know, I've got a feeling the Holy Ghost has done that with the church. We have a camel ride sometimes, don't we? But I want to tell you the good news. When Eliezer and Rebecca and the camel got near home, Eliezer heard Rebecca say something. Now remember Rebecca had never seen the sun and they'd passed many fields I'm sure. 
But she said, who's that in the field? And he said, that's the son. And what the Bible says then is interesting because right up until this point, if you read that passage through, through Genesis, you'll find every second verse talks about a camel. Right? From the time Eliezer left home to the time that he got back, every second verse is talking about a camel. You know, he had to get the camels to go, he had to get the camels to be watered and, and so all the way through. And then he gets there, the camel gets down and the Bible says she got off the camel and went to be with the son in the father's house. And from there after, you never read about another camel in Rebecca's life. Isn't that interesting? Now, there's going to be a time when we get off it. But until we do, until we go with the son into the father's house, understand we're on a journey but the one who is with us, and again, Eliezer, we can tell you more about that because when he called her, he gave her gifts, the Bible says. This one who has given us all this, sure he's given us a camel ride, but it's going to work out really well. Why? Because we are in Christ. The fruit of the vine is growing from us. The life of the vine is flowing in us. Let's pray. Father... We thank you for that reality. We are in Christ. And Lord, I pray this morning that we will grab it, we will know it, that Lord, we'll be encouraged and built up and blessed in him. Lord, may we know the life of Jesus. And may God, we be, Lord, just encouraged to know that no matter what the circumstances might be, no matter how rough it might be, we know that you're going to take us through and in all things work good because we love you and we are the called according to your purpose. So, Father, let each one of us here just go from this place today knowing your blessing and presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, just grab a microphone there, George, and you can... The prayer team was just praying before... had a word of knowledge about pain in the base of the, the head or the neck. If, you, if that's you, come forward for prayer. God wants to heal you. Uh, we felt that uh, the Lord was saying, uh, those of you who are tired and weary, come to me, the Lord says, and I will give you rest. And the Lord wants uh, you to know the heart of the Father for freedom. A message to the church, uh, come to the Father. Let him pour out his heart to you and be blessed there is no sin so big that he cannot forgive and he loves to heal god will heal that situation the father wants us all to know his heart and know that he is father thanks god thanks george well we're not going to sing we've gone a little bit over so the prayer term will be here right now if you want to come uh, for prayer please do so otherwise Let's join for a cup and let's just pray as we go. Father, let us know your presence to be so real. Lord, we cannot mistake it for anything else. Lord, as we go through this week, may your grace and your mercy live through us and in us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you heaps this morning. Prayer team will be available right now.